Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to first begin by acknowledging and celebrating the Australian Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and whose cultures are amongst the oldest continuing cultures in human history. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure this evening to welcome you and our speaker, Ambassador Carl Eikenberry, and his wife, Mrs Ching Eikenberry, to the Australian National University. We're indeed privileged to have a speaker as distinguished as Ambassador Eikenberry what I am sure will be a most informative presentation on the situation in Afghanistan. I would also particularly like to welcome the Ambassador of the United States and the Ambassador of Afghanistan, as well as other members of the diplomatic community here this evening. Without further ado, I'd now like to call upon the Director of the Centre for Arab and Islamic Studies, Professor Amel Saikal, himself a renowned scholar on Afghanistan, to introduce Ambassador Eikenberry's presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm truly honored to introduce Ambassador Carl Eikenberry, who requires actually no introduction. He's already become a household name, not only in Afghanistan, but in the wider world in the last many years. But just to refresh your memory, um, Ambassador Eikenberry is one of the United States' most distinguished military officer and a diplomat. He is also one of the most decorated military officer and diplomat. He has got more awards than the years that I have spent as an academic at the <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get anything at the end, but... <laughs> but just to refresh your memory, Carl Eikenberry is the Payne Distinguished Lecturer at the Freeman Spurger Institute for International Studies at the Stanford University at the moment. Prior to his appointment at Stanford, he served as the U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan from May 2009 until July 2011, where he led a civilian search directed by President Barack Obama to reverse an insurgent momentum and set the conditions for transition to full Afghan sovereignty by, two, by the end of 2014. Before his appointment as Chief of Mission in Kabul, Ambassador Eikenberry had a 35-year career in the United States Army, retiring in April 2009 with the rank of Lieutenant General. His military operational post included Commander and Staff Officer with mechanized light airborne and ranger and in infantry units in the cont continental US, Hawaii, Korea, Italy, and Afghanistan as the commander of American led coalition forces from 2005 to 2007. He has served in various policy and political military positions, including deputy chairman of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and uh, 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 NATO's military committee in Brussels. Of course, I can go on and talk about his other appointments, but I just wanted to sort of escape that part and let you know that Ambassador Eikenberry is a graduate of the US Military Academy. He has a master's degree from Harvard University in East Asian Studies and Stanford University in Political Science, and was a National Security Fellow at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. He earned an interpreter's certificate in Mandarin Chinese from the British Foreign Commonwealth Office while studying at the United Kingdom Ministry of Defense Chinese Language School in Hong Kong and has an advanced degree in Chinese history from Nanjing University and the People's Republic of China. He's fluent in Mandarin. You'll be governing our Prime Minister, uh, our foreign, former Prime Minister. Former <laughs> Prime Minister. <laughs> Ambassador Eikenberry serves as a trustee for the International Institute for Strategic Studies, is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and Council of American Ambassadors, and was previously the president of the Foreign Area Offices Association. He has published numerous articles on U.S. military training, tactics, and strategy, and on Chinese ancient history and Asia-Pacific security issues. 
it has a commercial pilot's license where you have a fallback position <laughs> and instrument rating and also enjoy sailing and scuba diving. That I cannot identify with. <laughs> and of course, he's married to Mrs. Chang Eikenberry. Uh, but Ambassador Eikenberry mastered the Chinese language before. <laughs> Um, this current visit to the ANU is a result of several years of communication uh, between Ambassador Eikenberry and myself. I first met Ambassador Eikenberry at a conference in Istanbul in 2005. He walked into the room as a three-star general with his full uniform to talk about Afghanistan. And I was sitting there and I said, oh my God, another American general who is now going to tell us that how wonderful the United States is doing in Afghanistan and everything is in order. But soon I discovered that Ambassador Eikenberry is one of those distinguished generals who has mastered all the intellectual skills that is really needed to make the progress possible in a country like Afghanistan. And he came across as somebody who is very much on the top of the subject. And I thought to myself, if the United States can have generals like Carl Eikenberry, then I think the world will be a safer place to live in. And from that point, I, I thought it was my duty to do whatever I can to get uh, uh, Carl Eikenberry to come and visit us at the ANU. And in the meantime, then we met in a number of other conferences. And one of them was, I think, in Brussels. And I gave a talk on Afghanistan as well as on Iran. And Ambassador Eikenberry walked across and said, I would like to have a cup of your talk on Iran. And I said, wow, Ambassador Eikenberry has a much wider interest. And from that point, I thought, well, I might be able to indoctrinate him. I give him a few books on Iran that I've written on Afghanistan and so on. But it is indeed a great privilege and a great honor to have you, and I'm so pleased that you've been able to make time for a very busy schedule to come and visit us. Um, in fact, Ambassador Altenberg and I were supposed to be in Potsdam at a conference in the last two days. But I'm so glad we didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> and Ambassador Altenberg tonight is going to combine the skills of a very, uh, of a brilliant diplomat and a military officer to inform us on the topic of assisting counterinsurgency in a state building effort in Afghanistan. I cannot think of a most qualified person to speak on this topic than Ambassador Carl Eikenberry. Would you please join me in welcoming him? Well, thank you, uh, thank you very much for those kind words. I, I have to tell you, after that uh, introduction, which is one of the uh, kindest uh, introductions I've ever had, they can only go downhill for a minute. <laughs> so you're free to leave if you'd like to at this juncture. Uh, first of all, let me uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Young, and let me uh, thank you, uh, Professor Seichel, for inviting Jing and I to uh, come here, to invite us to uh, Australia National University. What a prestigious uh, university indeed this is. Uh, this morning, I had the honor of meeting some of the faculty and the senior researchers and the students at the Center for Middle East and Islamic Studies. I have to tell you, that's an extraordinarily inspirational uh, group there. I'm hoping that uh, tomorrow to have an opportunity to talk to see how we might further enrich ties between Stanford University and the uh, Center in the uh, future. Six no Nobel laureates in the uh, ranks of uh, faculty, former uh, students, and I was telling uh, Jing this afternoon, I'm hoping that some of the prestige rubs off on me before I uh, head back home here. By way of background uh, for myself, uh, I mean, he's very kind, uh, truly, in his introductory remarks. After 9-1-1, uh, the United States of America, indeed the world, Australia, uh, many individuals took great detours in their lives. Uh, for myself, for my wife, uh, we took a great detour, as Amin said, that prior to that time, 
most of my military career at that juncture had been as a serving operational infantry officer in various assignments around the world. And my second uh, track that I was on, as we talk about, was as an Asia Pacific and China specialist. I was in the Pentagon on 9-1-1 when American Airlines Flight 77, commandeered by an Al-Qaeda terrorist, plowed in to the building just beneath the office that I was in. I was very fortunate to get out of the uh, building alive. I was on the third floor. There were two killed on the third floor. Most of the casualties were on the second and first floor just beneath me. But in an adjacent office, we lost two. Uh, I could never dream uh, talking about detours then. For the next decade, eight of the next 10 years were to be either living in Afghanistan, two tours as a military commander, a tour as the ambassador, five of 10 years. But in addition, three more years were spent in assignments outside of Afghanistan, but where a majority of my portfolio was involved with Afghanistan. A year on the Army staff right after 9-1-1, where I was involved in the planning for the conduct of operations into Afghanistan in the initial year of the mission, and then two years, as Amin said, in Brussels, Belgium at NATO headquarters, where well over 50% of my portfolio was Afghanistan. Now having said all of that, uh, I'm by no means an expert uh, on Afghanistan. I'm not uh, a speaker of the Dari or Pashto uh, language. Uh, I wasn't uh, raised in Afghanistan. Any foreigner who I think says they have a mastery of the complex politics that is Afghanistan, well, they need to uh, have a bit of a check to uh, validate that uh, claim. I'm reminded of a uh, humorous story when I first arrived in Afghanistan on my first tour of duty in 2002. Uh, there, meeting with the Lieutenant General Asiki, who was the commander of the new Afghan border police. So a week on the ground in Afghanistan, I'd only had a month's notice I was going, so I devoured about 10 books on the uh, country and got into Afghanistan like I always do, just plow ahead, immerse yourself, and try to figure things out. So here was this dinner with uh, Lieutenant General Asipi. I had an interpreter, a Dr. Najib, a good young man, a great interpreter. Uh, he had about a 98% accuracy on interpreting, but he was 110% when it came to emotion, being able to express himself, being, being able to capture the nuance of the conversation, anger, happiness. And but with Dr. Najib, young Dr. Najib, that as he would get more excited, more into the conversation, that accuracy would come down from 98% to 95%. And so there was a bit of a trade here. Now back to Lieutenant General Asifi. I had turned to Lieutenant General Asifi through the, uh, my good interpreter, speaking in Dari to English, and said, General Asifi, can you tell me a little bit about Afghanistan history? Can you tell me about the people? I really, you know, I'm going to be working closely with the people, with the new Afghan army. Tell me a little bit about your culture and your traditions. And he warmed to the topic, and accordingly, Dr. Najib warmed. And as he warmed, the accuracy started to decline. So Lieutenant General Asifi uh, reached a culminating point over the course of about 15 minutes. Just a good person, excited about his country, excited and proud of the Afghan people. And clearly what he was saying is that the Afghan people, of course, have this long tradition, this long culture of being great hosts to foreigners when they come to their country. But Dr. Najib, when we got to this culminating point, said, General, Dr. Uh, General Asifi just said that the Afghan people have a long and a very proud history of inviting foreigners to their country and then hospitalizing them. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I think what he meant to say, inviting them to their country and showing them great hospitality. <laughs> but back to, I'm by no means an expert on Afghanistan to this day. I can't say with 100% accuracy <laughs> that that was the, uh, the case. Let me uh, then start with uh, some brief uh, formal remarks here. And what I'd like to do is provide you with an assessment, with an update of where I think we are in Afghanistan. We, uh, speaking especially for our Australian uh, uh, colleagues and uh, to fellow Americans who are here for a broader coalition, where are we in Afghanistan 10 years after our initial intervention into the uh, country in October 2001? I'll cover two topics. First of all, I'd like to talk about continuities, and maybe more importantly, discontinuities in our strategies that we've had 
in Afghanistan since 2001, and I'll lay those out for you. I'm hoping that a review over a 10-year period of time of these various strategies with the, with the discontinuities will be useful to this group to give you a context then of measuring where we are in Afghanistan today. Also importantly to understand when it comes to the Afghan people, there's a degree of frustration that comes with 10 years now in Afghanistan as they too have witnessed these discontinuities in strategy. Secondly then, I'd like even more briefly talk about four challenges that we're facing in Afghanistan today at this moment as we proceed with the transition to full Afghan sovereignty by the end of 2014. First of all, regarding our strategies in Afghanistan since 9-1-1, as said, I'd like to submit up front that we've had several, at times, disjointed strategies. And these have suffered from a misalignment, I believe, at times, from ends, ways, and means. Let me, by oversimplifying, talk about four different periods of time in Afghanistan. First, 2001 to 2003. At that time, our strategic objective was following quickly upon the attack upon the United States by Al-Qaeda. The defeat of Al-Qaeda and the elimination of the remnants of the Taliban regime that had provided sanctuary to Al-Qaeda. And remembering with that sanctuary that they enjoyed inside of Afghanistan, their ability to plan, plot, and direct attacks like the awful attack of 9-1-1. Characterized by a very light footprint on the ground of international coalition forces. Uh, characterized by a light footprint on the diplomatic development side. Remember that a very, very eminent UN Special Representative and Secretary General who I have immense respect for, Ladkar Brahimi, he also was the advocate of the light footprint. There was a general consensus that a light footprint was the touch that was needed at that moment. There was not really in-depth consideration that was being given in the years 2001 to 2003 about state building and nation building. Let me give you three quick examples of being there on the ground at that period of time, manifestations of the idea about the light footprint that we could succeed in Afghanistan without having to invest a lot of resources. Number one, the great project of the ring road in Afghanistan, the refurbishing and the building of a ring road stretching from Kabul to Kandahar, Herat, mazar -e sharif looping back to Kabul. With good reason, President Bush's administration in the early years of our intervention in Afghanistan said this is a hugely symbolic project, and indeed it was. But I remember distinctly on the ground as a major general at that time, not working in the field of development, but in a lot of meetings where this was talked about, endless talking about project, about the progress on the ring road, very little talk about building political institutions in Afghanistan. Second example, as we're on the ground in Afghanistan, pushing hard against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban remnants, at that time, without many forces, then political expediency, military expediency, what do we do? We turn to various warlords and make them our ally, call upon their militia forces, and we employ them in the fight against Taliban. And indeed, it was expediency that came at a cost because it's some of those warlord leaders whose own misconduct in the 1990s during the era of the Civil War led to the rise of the Taliban as a counter-reaction to the rapacious rule of the Mujahideen warlords. Third example, Afghan National Army. Some of you may know, some may not know, that today we're talking about an Afghan army of end strength perhaps by 2014 of 20,000, maybe 20,000, uh, 200, uh, I'm sorry, 200,000, perhaps 220,000. Back in October and November of 2002, as then Finance Minister Ashraf Ghani and then Major General Carl Eikenberry were sitting around talking in advance of the Bonn II conference about what should be the size and capabilities of the Afghan National Army. Believe it or not, we said 70,000 is the right figure. 70,000 is about right. Uh, let's be prepared because we know several of the commanders of the Afghan forces will want to go higher. Fallback position, 80,000 max. That's all that's needed. Capabilities, 
well, they don't need counterinsurgency capabilities. We didn't even talk about counterinsurgency capabilities because Taliban had been defeated, hadn't it, at that point in time. We talked about building an Afghan National Army that would have in Kabul, available to the president, available to the central government, a first among equal army corps, a formation of about 10,000, about like an American Light Infantry Division, and that would be highly mobile, and guess what their main attribute would be? Quickly be able to get on airplanes or on trucks and move to an area of the country where there might be a power broker who's contemplating breaking away from the central government. And here we are today talking about an army of 200,000, 220,000, whose capabilities must include the ability to fight the resilient Taliban. Also, during that first period of time, 2001 to 2003, I have to say with regard to Pakistan, our entire dialogue with Pakistan was about the defeat of Al-Qaeda, attack Al-Qaeda. We were not thinking about an Afghan Taliban sanctuary inside of Pakistan. Second period of time, 2003 to 2008. At that point, the security situation is starting to manifestly decline. It's becoming evident by 2006 that the security situation is trending in the wrong direction, better than it is today, but downward trending. But at the same time, we have NATO transition going on. So as I'm in command in Afghanistan, I'm looking at southern Afghanistan, I can see trend lines starting to decline, again, not like it is today. But at the same time, we have a lot of NATO forces coming in, non-US NATO forces, relieving the US coalition. And the US will concentrate in eastern Afghanistan so at that point in time, the uh, security situation is beginning to, climb, to decline. It doesn't become apparent, however, until 2007, 2008, that we have a very severe problem. We're talking more during, that, uh, during those five years about the so-called hardening of the Afghan state, developing an Afghan state now with sufficient quality that it will prove re uh, resilient against efforts of international terrorism to come back into Afghanistan but we're not really well defining exactly what the attributes of that state should be. State and nation building in the dialogue with Washington, D.C. at least, and most of my remarks tonight will certainly be from the U.S. perspective. Most of the state, and uh, we're talking increasingly in Washington, D.C. about state building and nation building, uh, but what we find is that we don't have sufficient resources. And once the war in Iraq begins in 2003, but especially in 2004 and beyond, where the situation in Iraq is really declining, resources uh, that could have been made available to the Afghan theater are going to the West. Contradictions begin to emerge during this period of time and start to get rather severe in terms of what would be international U.S. NATO goals and objectives for nation building, state building, political institutions, economic development, and President Karzai's view, and the Afghan elite view. Also, during this period of time, lastly, with regard to, Afghan, uh, with regard to Pakistan, it's becoming more evident to Washington, D.C. that the sanctuary that the Afghan insurgents uh, enjoy inside of Pakistan have to be addressed but greatly perplexed about how to deal with this severe problem. Third period of time, 2009 to 2011, my period of time as ambassador, and this is during the first two years of the President Obama's administration. President Obama had campaigned as candidate Obama about Afghanistan being the war of necessity compared to Iraq, a war in which the outcomes linked directly to U.S. vital national interest. He defined the war up to that point as having been a somewhat neglected theater of war and under-resourced. There were many more explicit discussions at this juncture now about how to harden Afghanistan. Again, what should be the capabilities and the attributes of the Afghan state so that it would be strong enough, sustainable, that it would be able to resist future possible incursions and return of international terrorism. Also, this administration increasingly clear and rather open and blunt about the challenges now emanating from sanctuary in Pakistan and those who have been reading about Secretary of State Clinton's recent trip to Pakistan will see that that's really an evolution of President Obama's 
uh, policies when he first came into office. The security situation up front in President Obama's review of the security situation in Afghanistan uh, revealed through military assessments and an assessment that I shared was that the security situation was approaching a very dangerous tipping point. Our military, the U.S. military, and many non-U.S. NATO military commanders all argued for a robust increase in forces and the resources to complement those military forces consistent with our counterinsurgency doctrine. And there was a consensus now that security had deteriorated to a point that additional forces were absolutely essential. The belief was broadly stated that without improved security, nothing else would be possible. Nice to talk about political solutions, nice to talk about further economic development, but a consensus that security had now deteriorated greatly. And that needed to be reversed before we even have the space, the window, the opportunity to talk about political solutions. So we surged forward to arrest the uh, Taliban momentum and help build the strength of the Afghan National Security Forces, the police and army of Afghanistan, to increase the government of Afghanistan's governing capacity. But again, the specific goals when we talk about governments and developments, they weren't granularly defined. I leave Afghanistan after two additional years now as the ambassador, quite candidly saying I'm not sure that they can be granularly defined. On the civilian side then, it was broadly understood as I came in as the U.S. ambassador that we needed to come in behind our military wherever they were going to apply concentrated force in a counterinsurgency campaign, places like Kandahar, places like Helmand province, places like some uh, sectors in Oristan province where the Australian forces have fought so well. And we would come in behind the military and provide developmental assistance and do the best we could to help the Afghans establish some kind of local governance authority. At the national level, we knew again broadly the importance of strengthening key departments and agencies of the state, bolstering the rule of law, helping to fortify critical political institutions, and promoting economic growth. So how did we on the civilian side go about meeting this challenge then? quantitatively and qualitatively, briefly. First of all, quantitatively. A very impressive buildup supported by the Department of State, supported by President Obama's uh, administration that went far beyond the Department of State and included the Department of Treasury, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, USAID, the Department of Agriculture. When Jay and I arrived in uh, Kabul in May of 2009, we had about 325 civilians on the ground. When we departed, we had about 1,300 civilians. It's a very impressive increase. Now, having come from a military background, uh, I know as I looked at it formally as a military commander, when you say, well, you surge from 325 to 1,300, and my response probably as a military commander would have been wonderful. Now, how are you going to get the other 98,000 civilians so that you can equal our military strength on the ground. What I did learn as a military, as a civilian ambassador, however, first of all, this is not easy work. Militaries are made to be expeditionary. The Australian military, it exists not to fight on the Australian homeland, but it exists to deploy, to provide security, extended security, and that's how you, and that's how we defend our homeland. Civilian organizations of government, outside of, to a degree, the Department of State, to a degree, USAID, is not designed to surge and deploy abroad in places like Afghanistan. So if we were to take an FBI agency coming into Afghanistan and serving the embassy or serving outside of our embassy as part of our civilian mission, that FBI agent needs to be recruited. They need to be trained to get ready to go to Afghanistan. They need to then when they arrive, have a place to sleep, a place to uh, eat, and they also need to be acclimated in the situation in the country and then integrated into the team. Not easy work. We also task-organized our civilian teams in ways that I think were rather innovative. 
uh, in the first instance, when I first took over as ambassador, every military commander at senior levels, when asked, do you have a civilian counterpart, would say no. I have a civilian advisor. I have a political advisor, and that's the way that we organize. I changed that as the ambassador to some consternation for my military colleagues, but eventually, actually quickly, they accepted the reform. And the reform was this, that I gave every military commander a civilian fully empowered counterpart. We changed it from no more political advisors, now we have senior civilian representatives. And they have a set of delegated authorities that I as the ambassador, on paper, had signed to them. Every civilian in their domain, coterminous with their military partner, was under their many ambassadorial authorities. Resources that were being spent in that particular domain fell under the purview of that one civilian. So that was one reform that we made. We were able to husband our limited resources and give a more coherent, unified voice to the military. Secondly, in terms of our organization, we organize functionally as opposed to more industrial age organized according to the department and agency that sent you from Washington, D.C. to join the team there. And so we had, for instance, one functionally organized agricultural group. Well, it had USAID, our development agency that was doing agricultural work. We had the group led by somebody from our Department of Agriculture. We had military that had agricultural National Guard teams on the field, and they fell <coughs> under the civilians' control. We organized infrastructure teams and so forth. So we, or, we took a look at what are the real problem sets, as we like to say, inside of Afghanistan, and we organized functionally around those. We dramatically expanded our resource allocations. Uh, perhaps during Q&A, we can have a discussion about uh, when it comes to development, is it numbers that matter, or is it quality that matters? Well, the answer is they both do. But we went from a $2.4 billion program of record when I came in as the ambassador to a $4.1 billion annual program of record. And lastly, in terms of innovations that we made in Afghanistan about the nature and the way that we organized our development programs, there too, I think we had uh, some very significant advances. So what was the outcome then over a two year period of time with our military and our civilian efforts? And our now, including NATO, including the international community very much, including Australia, of course, in all of this. The period was punctuated by security gains in areas wherever our militaries were to concentrate force. We had a very successful and continue to have special operations campaign that made great strides in damaging Taliban command and control, especially at the mid-level. There were political consequences that uh, we paid for that campaign, but in the main, I think it was a major uh, win. We had a very significant enlargement and continued with the Afghan National Security Forces with some qualitative improvements. Moving beyond the military domain, we had a significant, um, we had presidential and parliamentary elections. These were highlighted by fraud, uh, but ultimately they were accepted as legitimate by the most important audience, and that was the Afghan people, without the resort to violence to try to contest the results of the election. We've had some improvements as well in subnational governance, a continuing expansion, really dramatic since 2002, of social services, especially in the areas of healthcare and education, a rise in illicit agricultural production, unfortunately also a rise in illicit agricultural production, and improvements in certain sectors of the economy. Additionally, and this is very critical, we had severely disrupted Al-Qaeda's capabilities existing in Pakistan, not in Afghanistan, through the methodical elimination of Al-Qaeda's leadership over the last several years. We have to remember when we say that, the role of Afghanistan for us, for Australia, for the international coalition when we talk about outcomes and gains against Al-Qaeda. We have to remember that our bases for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets, our strike capabilities, our drones, our special forces, our listening posts, our human intelligence, without Afghanistan and the ability then to base those kind of operations 
and capabilities out of Afghanistan, we would not be making the gains against Al-Qaeda in Pakistan that we are. Against this period of, uh, against the gains over this period of time, of course, there were disappointments and there's been setbacks as well. This period of time uh, is punctuated as well by tensions with President Karzai on our strategic approach. It was also clear that greater differences were now beginning to emerge with the Afghan political elite about the pace and goals of state building and economic development. The growth of massive corruption, emblematic of this was the Kabul bank crisis, and sometimes very, what's called an intense debates between our military and our civilian teams on the ground about resource allocation and prioritization with increasingly, in an odd way, in a positive way, the Afghans more and more now entering those debates as well. The fourth period is the period of time from 2011, about the time Jing and I leave uh, Afghanistan, until we project the end of 2014. And that's what we call the transition to Afghan leave. This is a formal process, as you know, that's been agreed to by NATO and the Afghan government, significantly, though, endorsed by the United Nations and by the United Nations mission on the ground in Afghanistan. And this transition process, a formal structured process, is one that now, over the next three years, should lead to the Afghan National Security Forces, the Army and Police, having 100% responsibility for security throughout Afghanistan, albeit still with NATO support. <coughs> Efforts are being made by the U.S. Embassy on the ground and by our military forces as well to divest themselves, to divest U.S. military authorities of detention responsibilities, detention authorities inside of Afghanistan as well, we're in the process of beginning to dismantle PRTs, Provincial Reconstruction Teams, as Australia participates in an Oruzgan province. President Karzai has talked about those Provincial Reconstruction Teams and has said uh, that these Provincial Reconstruction Teams can amount to shadow or parallel governments inside his own country, and indeed he's correct. So what is really Transition 2014 all about? It's about Afghanistan, the new government of Afghanistan, going beyond the de jure sovereignty that they enjoy, the de facto sovereignty. If you have 140,000 international troops in the country, and they're on the front line of combat operations, if they are conducting detention operations, if you have provincial reconstruction teams that Afghans will turn to before they will turn to their own government to try to capture resources, that country does not enjoy sovereignty. So transitions about de facto Afghan sovereignty. To achieve our goals, and they're very ambitious goals, now that our militaries are all shifting their weighted efforts to further training and equipping of the Afghan National Security Forces, perhaps on a more accelerated timeline. Our embassy and many of the embassies, I know the international organizations, emphasis now is on sustainable economic development as opposed to support for stability operations. Focus programs on rule of law, basic subnational governance, and bolstering representative governance. And then lastly, a so-called diplomatic surge to complement the military and the civilian surges launched early this year on the United States part with the appointment of Ambassador Mark Grossman as Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. And Mark's charge is a, uh, a very important one, a very difficult task. What Mark is working on, along with the United Nations and international partners, is twofold. Uh, efforts to try to get reconciliation talks, political reconciliation talks, going between the Afghan government and the Taliban, knowing that those talks really have to be endorsed by Pakistan. And then secondly, efforts to try to create a regional solution, or let's say a regional architecture, that would find ways to support a lasting political settlement inside of Afghanistan. What might U.S. presence look like in Afghanistan after transition? I want to emphasize that sometimes, especially with our Afghan friends, very worried about, given their modern history, about abandonment from the international community, sometimes they talk about 
2014 and transition as the point where the international community then evacuates from Afghanistan. That is not at all the case. In 2014, there will be a transition, as I said, on the ground to a more capable Afghan government enjoying de facto sovereignty. But the presence, at least on the US side, but we don't know exactly what it will look like. One of the advantages now of not being in the government, I can speculate. And I can speculate publicly. What might our military presence look like in 2014? I don't know, 10,000, maybe 20,000 uh, troops, several missions security assistance to the Afghan National Army and Police, the, uh, the completion of the task of preparing the Afghan Army and Police. It's not going to end in 2014. There will be a very robust security assistance mission on the ground. We'll have to have perhaps some limited capabilities to have, help the Afghan National Army and Police continue to fight against Afghan insurgency, against narco traffickers, and so there may be some capabilities that the Afghans lack, uh, air support, logistics, intelligence. I could well see us having those capabilities on the ground. And then finally, on terrorism. International terrorism in the region will not be defeated by 2014. And I would expect it likely that we, the United States, and maybe some of our allies will keep on the terrorist capabilities there. Footnote to all of that. All of this. Uh, could be the case based upon decisions in Washington, D.C., NATO, but also, importantly, 2014, an Afghanistan that has de jure and de facto sovereignty. So what do the Afghan people, what do the Afghan government want in 2014? That will also play a more important role, perhaps, than what, what any foreign country wants. On the civilian side, Right now, we have civilians at 80 different locations around uh, Afghanistan, 80 different uh, locations. Uh, they're in districts like Marja in Helmand province. Uh, they're in uh, far flung places around the country, generally operating side by side with military partners. By the end of 2014, what I would expect is that we'll have no one at the district level, no one at the provincial level. Those provincial reconstruction teams will be closed down. We'll have a large, robust embassy, at least large by similar standards of a country like Afghanistan globally, population of 30 million, and an impoverished country, but a very important friend and uh, ally. Uh, right now, we have 1,300 civilians. Perhaps by the end of 2014, that might be seven, 800 civilians. And beyond the embassy, I would expect there will probably be a four consulate locations around the country. In fact, we'll open two of those consulate locations here very soon in Harat and mazar -e sharif Development budget was $4.1 billion last year. It's not going to be $4.1 billion in 2014. Um, will it be a, million, a billion dollars, up to $2 billion? Maybe in that uh, range. But, Having said that, if you look then at that presence in 2014 in that set of missions, that is not leading us to a point where we say transition is about the withdrawal of the United States of America, NATO, and the international community from Afghanistan. It's now a changed relationship with the sovereign government of Afghanistan. So, Having described our past and current strategies, I said it would be very brief in talking about challenges that we're facing uh, as we move forward to 2014 and beyond. And let me work my way through those four challenges. First of all, Pakistan and the sanctuary that the Afghan Taliban still enjoy inside of Pakistan. If that sanctuary is not effectively addressed, I have to tell you, based upon a lot of experience on the time in Afghanistan, transition becomes much more problematic Transition becomes much more expensive. Transition will come at the cost of much more blood of the United States, our allies, and the Afghan people. Second challenge, the risk attendant with the phenomenal growth of the Afghan National Security Forces. Number one is cost. The cost of sustainment of the Afghan National Security Forces in the year 2014, we estimate to be about seven to eight billion dollars a year. The United States, to give you a Comparison: The United States currently provides Israel with about $3 billion of security assistance a year. Now, for the problem of getting $7 and $8 billion, remember the government of Afghanistan by the end of 2014 might be able to generate revenue of about $2.5 billion. So that represents a shortfall of 
anywhere between five and five point five billion dollars. And who is going to pay for that? Well, hopefully our NATO allies, hopefully NATO ISAF countries will continue to be generous, but there's going to be still a very significant price tag. And that gets into then the question of U.S. sustainability with our own economic problems and our political challenges that we're facing. Institutional sustainability of the Afghan National Security Forces. Police and the Army, large organization, complicated. The Afghans have never, never in their history directed an organization of that size and complexity. At this point in time, do they have the managerial capabilities to do so? As I said, we'll have a continuing uh, enduring security assistance mission, but it will still be smaller than it is today. This will prove difficult for the Afghans. Third is political reliability of the force. And fourth is the potential for a national security state to begin to emerge in Afghanistan. Once again, $2.5 billion at the most is what we would think the government of Afghanistan can generate in revenues by the year 2014. $8 billion of national security cost. So you look at a country like Pakistan, which has a robust national security community and forces, and it skews state development. In fact, it can skew state politics. Third, the uncertain qu uh, problems that are going to obtain from the economic downturn that Afghanistan will most assuredly experience as our military forces begin to pull back and as our level of development assistance comes down. Uh, today, we think that Afghanistan's spending from their government is about $1.6 billion, but foreign spending that we've got injecting cash into the Afghan economy, somewhere between 10 and $12 billion. And that amount of money is going to start to decline over time. With that, you'll have an economic recession. With an economic recession, as we know from our own politics and our own countries, you've got political consequences that come with economic recessions. But in the case of Afghanistan, what makes it different is that with fragile politics, you have the danger of insecurity obtaining from that. Fourth and last, the resilience and staying power of the central government and the political institutions that underpin it, that serve as the basis for the legitimacy of the Afghan government. There's problems of massive corruption. Significantly, there's a question of political elites that are not willing to commit fully to political institutions that are heavily supported and subsidized by the international community because they look ahead to 2014. They see the international military presence will decline. The diplomatic presence on the ground will decline. Development assistance will decline. And so are they willing then at this critical juncture to try to invest further into their own political institutions or will they hedge. Now the problems that we face here in Afghanistan, when I talk about this final topic of government accountability, rule of law, is not unique to the Afghan experience. If I could quote from an individual named Townsend, uh, Townsend Hoops, who served as a senior defense official in the United States President Johnson's administration during the Vietnam War, which had Australia was an ally of the United States. In his 1969 book on the American War in Vietnam called The Limits of Intervention, Townsend Hoops, discussing the challenges of promoting better governance, wrote, pacification, by the way, using pacification, talking about extending government into local areas, pacification involved nothing less than political counter-revolution in the interest of democracy. And precisely for this reason, it could not be planned and carried out by foreigners. The dilemma facing the Johnson administration, Hoops goes on to write, was of course that the government of Vietnam lacked both organizational drive and reforming zeal, and that its operatives did not commend themselves to the villagers in local areas as self-evident, authentic apostles of justice and democracy. Too often they were looked upon accurately as simply a different, reform, a different form of repression and exploitation. But the United States could not escape identification with the government of Vietnam. So from the perspective of interventionist nations, and we all are, 
The quality and reliability of the so-called host nation partner does and has always mattered when trying to promote accessible counterinsurgency. Let me conclude with saying that I think that over the past decade, through the efforts of the United States of America, through the efforts of Australia, through the efforts of many countries on the ground, and indeed, not to forget, through the efforts of many, many brave Afghan men and women, that there has been a foundation that's been established in terms of security force capability and improvements in security, in terms of governance of Afghanistan, in terms of the economy of Afghanistan. There is a foundation that's been built which gives us a <coughs> possibility, but I would not give a probability, to have success with transition. It's going to be more important with each year, though, that when we ask the question about how will we do with transition, what challenges are there, it's going to be increasingly important for the Afghan people and their leaders to stand up and provide the answers. I'll end on a very poignant story that has to, uh, takes me to uh, Walter Reed Army Medical Center, just recently uh, closed. In fact, uh, Jing and I were two of the last visitors to Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And uh, we visited Walter Reed when we came out of Afghanistan because Walter Reed is where are the soldiers who get so badly banged up in Afghanistan go for recovery. Great treatment center there, always a moving experience. But whenever we'd be in Washington, we'd go visit the soldiers. So on this particular occasion, I met a, a soldier, I'll just say, say his first name, Brian, from Brooklyn, New York. And uh, Brian was uh, like you and me, except a little bit different because Brian was, had lost both of his legs above his knee. Brian had lost his uh, left arm above his elbow. And thank God, Brian was right-handed and his right arm was still good. And uh, Brian was filled with uh, uh, a lot of enthusiasm when the United States ambassador to Afghanistan came to see him. He cranked himself up in his bed. He had his mother and father there. He was directing them to, and he was the uh, studio producer. Pictures he wanted to have taken. Combed his hair before the uh, pictures. And so I asked Brian, uh, Brian, tell me about what happened in the, uh, in the fight where you got banged up like this. And whenever you talk to a soldier, a sailor, or a marine that gets banged up like that, you always ask that question because it's going to take them many years to, uh, to come to grips with this. And they never tire of uh, telling this story and especially if they lost comrades in that fight because there's always a part of them that feels they let their comrade down. They survived and their comrade did not. So we went through this with Brian and then I asked Brian a question, Brian, how do you think we're doing where you were? Where were you, Brian? And Brian was in the Argandam in Kandahar, a district northwest of Kandahar City where two years ago the Taliban owned Kandahar, uh, owned the Argandam. And we had brave U.S. Army forces and Afghans go in and cleared the Argandab out. But there was many killed in action and there were many casualties like Brian had. Brian's answer, I wish I had had a tape recorder on when Brian gave this answer to me. Uh, like only a young private first class or a young uh, USAID development worker or a young diplomat out in the field, can give you just in a very straightforward, common sense way. Brian's answer was, how are we doing? Look, Ambassador, when I got into uh, Afghanistan for this tour of duty in the Argandab, um, I saw that we had built schools for the Afghans. We had built health clinics for the Afghans in the Argandab. We even got a road built, and it's helping the farmers get their goods to market. We got a great agricultural expert helping the Afghan farmers improve productivity. And Ambassador, on top of that, we're helping build an army in the, in the Argandam, and their police force is getting better. And he paused and said, Ambassador, there's not much more we can do in the Argandam. And I have to tell you, I think it's getting time for us to leave, and the Afghans are going to have to find their own destiny in the Argandam. And that's what I leave you with, with Afghanistan. We should be proud of what we've accomplished. The Afghans are going to need to continue to get international support and help in certain areas a lot beyond 2014, but we should not be at all ashamed of what we've done. In spite of our mistakes, in spite of our setbacks, 
We've done extraordinary things. The Australians have done extraordinary things in uh, where it's gone. But we've reached a point in time where now we need to step back, and increasingly it's going to be for the Afghans to find their own destiny. I'll stop here and take questions. Ambassador, my name is uh, Bruce Palacos. We met at lunch today. Um, the commander of ISAF and U.S. forces in Afghanistan, General Allen, has to um, adapt the, the campaign plan um, to cope with his diminishing combat power. Um, this question is within the context of surge recovery. Um, the original op plan was uh, to focus um, on places like the Arden Derby and Regional Command South and Southwest, and, and then to move into Regional Command East. Um, do you think he's now got the resources um, with a full third of US forces leaving the theater by this time next year um, to actually stabilize the South um, and to focus on, on a situation in Regional Command East that's really um, going a little pear-shaped? Well, most immediately when you talk about Regional Command East, that's where, of course, the threat of the Haqqani and the insurgents that uh, sit in North Waziristan in the federally administered tribal area come to uh, bear. So it does take me back to the question of Pakistan. Let me, uh, if I could, let me take on your question, though, in uh, two ways. First of all, about the transition itself. If I could elaborate a bit more on transition, that when President Obama ordered the surge in 2009, the concerns that we all had about going forward with the surge is, uh, does the surge lead us to go in deeper into Afghanistan, create more dependencies within Afghanistan, uh, get to a point where the Afghan National Security Forces are increasingly content with Australians and Americans, at least with all of our capabilities, then enabling them in more supporting roles than the other way around. Uh, would we be on a pathway of, well, I'll come back and just use the word dependency. So that was a concern that, the, uh, that our president had. And our president was also looking, very frankly, at severe economic problems for the United States of America right now on a comparative uh, scale where our economic edge is eroding. And so concern about the need to ensure at some point in time we, the United States, and our allies reach the tipping <coughs> point of commitments. At the same time, of course, he was concerned that if we were to try to transition too quickly, that the Afghans would then perhaps not commit to political institutions that we could destabilize Afghanistan as the Afghan people started to lose their confidence about enduring international support or long-term international support. So when he announced that in 2009, when he announced the surge, that we would start coming out in 2011, that was a commitment to the American people. And President Obama has kept his commitments to the American people and to our allies and to our Afghan friends. At the same time, though, already we were thinking about, well, what is the other bookend that needs to come into place? We've got one bookend, begin to withdraw in 2009, an incentive to the Afghans to start to move faster with picking up responsibilities, but we also needed to put another bookend out there because the Afghans concerned that 2009 meant we were just beginning to uh, evacuate and we were going to leave quickly. That's what led eventually to 2014 transition. So we have the two bookends in place. That's important when we talk about those bookends because you're asking the question about General Allen, how can he manage? We still got three years to manage the transition process. Once again, remembering that even in 2014, we're going to have a robust security assistance mission on the ground. The second point that I'd make, though, is about how far do U.S., Australian, NATO forces want to go. Uh, I remember in 2006 going up into Konar province and talking to a young American captain up in Konar. And he had fought his way up a road and had occupied yet another Ford operating base. Remember, at that time, we didn't have near as many troops on the ground. And this young captain, as he was explaining the situation around his Ford operating base, about 25 years old, commanding 100 uh, Army soldiers of the 10th Mountain Division, 
he said to me, you know, uh, General, I know Taliban's over in that next valley. You know, we cleared him out of this valley, we pushed him back into the next valley. And if I go into that next valley, I think I can get there, I'm going to take more casualties, but they'll retreat to the next valley. And he said, I'm thinking at some point in time, we have to get to that limit where we turn to our Afghan colleagues and the Afghan National Army and police and say, you know what? Taliban's in that next valley, and if you want to go after them, you've got the lead. So how do you make this into a real Afghan fight? General Allen's challenge is now having to assume more risk. I don't know if I'd call it military risk necessarily with our own forces, as much as risk with the Afghan National Army and police forces. I had a long talk with uh, President Hamid Karzai about his army and police, and he was very concerned that there was a growing dependency. This is a year ago. Great concern about growing dependency of the Afghan army and police on our forces, and complaints that he was hearing that they were staying inside of their fort operating bases, and unless there was a lot of US combat power made available to those Afghan commanders, they didn't really want to sally for it. I used the expression with President Karzai then of, said, President Karzai, I hear what you're saying. I think what you are getting at is that I could use an American expression. What you want is the Afghan army and police to go forward without the Americans and the Australians with them all the time and allow them occasionally to get a bloody nose. But you don't want them to get a broken nose. And he said, that's exactly, Ambassador, what I'm getting at right now. And so a pretty good, a pretty good metaphor about what General Allen has really got to be able to do at this juncture. There's valleys and hills that look 10 years into our presence in Afghanistan. I don't think Australian soldiers should be going forward to, uh, to clear out. The Afghans increasingly have got the capability to do it. They're going to need help. But it's going to be tough. If you're an Afghan, if you're a Australian major in Oruzgan, you want your Afghan partner to win just like your forces, 100 to nothing. You don't want it to be 99 to 1. You want it to be 100 to nothing. But sustainable for the Afghan army and the Afghan police, they're going to have to get used to winning 60 to 40. And that's going to be hard for our military forces, all type A that want to just club the enemy continuously. It's going to be hard for them to make some of those adaptations, but they've got to do it. And General Allen, I know, uh, as he took over, and he came over and spent a, a long uh, evening uh, with uh, Jane and I over at the uh, residence, I know uh, that that's where General Allen is exactly going. Thank you. My name is John Hart. Um, can I ask, uh, how do you think the extraordinary statement that President Karzai made on Saturday is likely to affect what the United States uh, uh, does in the period up to 2014? This is a statement that if there was This a is the statement where he talked about that he would, if a war between the United States and Pakistan, he yeah. joined Pakistan? That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, look, President Karzai, he's got a job that uh, nobody in this room wants to have. And, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't like to. I'd be waking up to his challenges uh, every morning. And believe me, now that I'm at uh, Stanford uh, University, I'm not waking up to the challenges that, uh, that he's facing. Uh, President Karzai, over the course of uh, 10 years, he said a lot of interesting things. Um, look, um, I'll say two things here. First of all, I not in a position where I can talk to President Karzai about what did he mean to say, what was the exact context. But President Karzai, he knows one thing, that uh, the United States, uh, 100 years from now, is still going to be halfway around the world. But 100 years from now, Pakistan's going to be on Afghanistan's border. So he has to have a formula where he's able to live with his neighbors. And a balancing act is he's trying to figure out how to apply pressure to Pakistan, him in a weakened position, together with the international community in the United States to deal with problems of terrorism and sanctuary uh, that exist in that country, and at the same time, 
trying to manage affairs so that things don't get into a real shooting match between the two countries. So I think that's probably what was in the back of his mind. Not ill intent towards the United States of America, not ill intent towards uh, the Australian mission in Afghanistan, but at the same time, I, I have to uh, tell you that uh, it was not uh, great timing to uh, <laughs> say such a, a thing as our Secretary of State uh, was just in Pakistan uh, delivering a fairly uh, tough message. And with uh, President Karzai uh, many times uh, always knowing what he meant but uh, the way he, sometimes he goes about and says it uh, can uh, be detrimental. And I have to say, frankly, I think this is another instance of that. Please. Thank you. Uh, Ian Dillon, Ambassador. Um, with reference to 2014, how confident are you that the Afghan government and the Afghan people will want a continuing American and NATO presence of uh, 20,000 plus? I, um, <clears throat> I don't know, but I believe that if we do a straight line projection to uh, 2014, that in the main, the Afghan bo uh, body politic would be supportive of a robust security assistance mission, would be uh, comfortable, underpinned by what we would call a status of forces agreement, a formal agreement between two countries that uh, outlines the, uh, sets rules and parameters for the conduct and the rights of, a, of foreign military soldiers serving in a country. Uh, predicated upon that kind of, as the Americans would call it, a SOFA agreement <coughs> with Afghanistan, uh, accepted politically or uh, underpinned politically by improvement of their parliament, I think that the general consensus in Afghanistan would be that they'd still want that uh, uh, enduring military presence, especially uh, with the agreement if by that point in time the fighting had diminished to the point or the Afghan National Security Forces had increased in capability to the point that our forces were not in frontline combat. Not as visible, maybe as we say, over the horizon, ready to uh, reinforce if necessary. But I think back to Afghan politics, what makes Afghan politics uh, unique, uh, or at least distinctive from Iraqi politics, is where many in Iraq, candidly, would say they really wish the US would keep some kind of military presence, not because of a threat from Iran, but because of the threat of domestic instability, serving more as referees and umpires. I have to say at this point in time, I, I think that kind of consensus view is still much more prevalent in uh, Afghanistan. Could change, but I believe that as we approach 2014, albeit presidential politics in play in 2014, the Afghans will face another presidential election, and that will be part of the campaign narratives about what should be the foreign military presence in our country, but I'm relatively confident that they'll want a uh, enduring U.S. and NATO military presence. And for the U.S. viewpoint, we'd be hopeful we have a presence that it is a NATO ISAF presence, not a uh, singular U.S. presence. Please. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, why don't you take it? I'm yes, a little. I think you need a helping hand. Oh. <laughs> Next question to Amanda. <laughs> Thank you. Go. Uh, you. Thank you, Pastor. I really enjoyed your talk, and you also foreshadowed my question. And it goes to the presidential election in um, 2014. President Karzai has indicated he will not run. In your talk, you mentioned there are concerns about the stability of the central government and um, whether the Afghan people 
want to invest in that anymore and to what level. So I would really like your views on the situation. And I forgot to tell you that my name is Judy Gamble. And uh, Judy, what, uh, and you're with? Uh, you're, I'm sorry? You're uh, you had affiliation? Yeah, affiliation, that's it. Oh, my affiliation, um, I'm an American, I'm an Australian, and I'm here listening to your talk. Great, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's clear. <laughs> um, yeah, Judy, important questions we have talked Let me talk uh, just about the election of uh, really of some of the elections. We the post Karzai here. President Karzai has said in several settings that uh, to include the media that in 2014 that's it for him if uh, he were to change his mind he'd also have to change the constitution of the state uh, because the constitution of the state says two terms five years each term and that's it and so it uh, would end for him in 2014. several uh, several big things have got to fall into place for this 2014 election to work as always, security. Security improved in some areas of the country. There's other areas of the country, frankly, where security may not even be as good as it was during the presidential election of 2009. But in some important areas, there's been improvements, very importantly, in Pashtun areas in southern Afghanistan, because in the 2009-2010 elections, the president of parliament, Pashtuns, claiming with some degree of, of uh, truth to it, that they were disenfranchised by bad security. Secondly, what has to fall into place, I believe, is there has to be a serious effort at electoral reform. I could talk about different electoral problems. Probably the most difficult one is what's called the single non-transferable vote problem for the parliament of Afghanistan. That really would need to fall into place by 2015. But if you're going to start talking about serious electoral reform, you can't wait the year before the presidential election. By the year before the presidential election, candidates will be emerging in the window for electoral reform, some of which is needed, as I said, for a good presidential election, desperately needed for parliamentary elections. It will all be lost because you move from presidential election immediately to parliamentary election. Third, what has to fall into place, I believe, is that Afghanistan needs national political movements right now. It's a very fragmented scene politically. I don't know if they're at the stage where you could have political parties. Political parties uh, still ring in uh, unpleasant ways in the Afghan uh, ears because they associate political parties to faction with the coming of communism and with then 30 years of times of trouble. But I think among the younger Afghans, and some of the more reformist-minded political leaders in Afghanistan, they're starting to also recognize we have to have nationally-based political movements and perhaps parties. All national, hopefully, uh, uh, not just ethnic parties or sub-regional parties, but parties that are based upon ideas that can start to pull in the best and the brightest, and especially can start to pull in and politically mobilize the youth of Afghanistan. But at this juncture, I see no movement there. President Karzai could do a great thing for his country. He could stand up now and push for electoral reform. He could stand up like George Washington, the first American president, and say, I don't believe in political parties, but I won't oppose political parties. And he could also start to try to figure out how to pick some of his supporters in the government, some very talented people start to delegate more authorities to them, some of the reformists, and allow them to emerge in ways that they might be potent political forces in a positive way in 2014. Ambassador, I'm Joan Beaumont from the ANU College of Arts and Social Sciences. Um, I'd be interested to hear more about um, how you think the Taliban will be preparing for 2014, um, and if you could do a short SWOT analysis, a bit similar to what you've done for for the Allied Command and the Afghan government. I mean, what would the Taliban's strategies be, acknowledging their strengths and weaknesses, 
in the next three years. Yeah, um, the Taliban have proven to uh, be a very uh, adaptive group militarily and politically. I'll show you an example. I'll give you an example of uh, political adaptation. Uh, I was one day doing what I'd like to do whenever I had free time in uh, Kabul. Not a lot of free time, but driving from one location to another in a congested uh, city. I'd look at my watch, they won't got an hour, I can fight my way back to the embassy or we can go someplace exciting with my interpreter and we'll just walk around. So on this particular day, my security team, of course, did not like this way of operating. <laughs> and so I said, well, let's go to this coffee shop. This coffee shop is very popular in uh, Kabul, and let's go in. And so I went in and sat down with a couple of businessmen from Ghazni province. Ghazni is in southeastern Afghanistan, and combined U.S.-Polish military forces operating with the Afghan National Army there. Been a troubled province. The uh, Taliban has made a lot of gains in Ghazni over the last several years, uh, juxtaposed to our gains in Helmand and Kandahar. So I said, well, uh, how is it that the Taliban businessmen from Ghazni, how is it they continue to advance? I mean, they're, they're odious. They, uh, they're, every poll shows they're not popular. And he said, no, Ambassador, it's not quite the case, always. Ghazni said, what's the Taliban doing in Ghazni right now? He said, well, they have a hotline. And you have a, a problem with Taliban governance because they have shadow governance in about 70% of the province. You have a problem with, sh uh, with governance? We've got a hotline. Give us your problem and we'll go deal with it. Now, the ways they go deal with it are not uh, necessarily what we would agree are rule of law methods to deal with such problems. They also, he told me, in Ghazni province, uh, have a system where uh, knowing that parents want, even in remote rural areas, parents want their boys and girls to get education. They have a system in which if they find that a particular teacher has been absent from class, they knock at that teacher's door in the evening and say, you've been missing classroom instruction, we understand. And uh, we really think it advisable that you show up at school tomorrow, or we'll be back tomorrow night. And very, very interesting, a, a, a kind of you know, socially responsible <laughs> intimidation campaign that's <laughs> out there. So, has the Taliban changed in terms of their ideology and their first principles? It's a great question. We don't know the answer. Part of the reason we don't know the answer is because we don't know how coherent the Taliban is as a movement. But my sense is that at a minimum they've become tactically agile. And I do think, having talked to some of the retired Taliban in uh, Kabul, who were awfully good links to the active Taliban in Pakistan, I met with them uh, with increasing frequency. My sense was that the Taliban had concluded they had made huge mistakes in governance in uh, the uh, late 1990s and that they had overreached. I think some of them believed that their relationship with al-Qaeda was a disaster. Uh, I believe that some of them believe that there might be no military victory for them, that the staying power of the international community has been extraordinary. They look at gains that the Afghan government and security forces are making, and yeah, people say they can wait them out. I'm not so certain of that. But a lot of this is conjecture. When you talk interestingly, you talk 10 years into this, you think we have a great understanding of the Taliban mindset. We don't but we see trends and indicators that would say perhaps they're changing their platform and could they uh, then reach an agreement with the government of Afghanistan where the Afghans were satisfied enough and importantly rights were protected, women's rights, political rights, human rights were protected. Could there be a way for the Afghans to uh, come back, uh, for the Taliban to come back in perhaps but then we could have an entirely different discussion, again, about the role of Pakistan in all of this. My own belief is that if Pakistan were to put pressure on the Afghan Taliban, enjoying sanctuary in their country, and say nothing more than you've got a choice. You need to stay here now and um, stop fighting and stay in refugee camps, or you can return to Afghanistan and you can fight if you want to there, or you can rejoin your community and the government, 
but you can't stay on our soil and fight against the government of Afghanistan. I believe if they were to make that step, then I think a political solution could be found to the problem, but not until. Thank you. One last question and a very short one with a short response. <laughs> yes, over there. good marks from establishing what was called an Afghan Enhance Program several years ago, where we've taken a cadre of officers and non-commissioned officers and given them immersion in the Farsi or Pashtu languages. Interesting assignments in Afghanistan when they go in, perhaps working in defense ministries or in the Ministry of the Interior. Uh, interesting assignments where they're sent out into relatively remote areas working with our special uh, operations forces. So uh, big gains that have been made, but uh, here also I will have to tell you that uh, there's limits to how far you can go with the, uh, the mapping of the uh, so-called human terrain. At the end, we aren't Afghans. At the end, we're not going to be able to develop a, uh, a large cadre of really good linguists and experts on Afghanistan. And so the best you can do, get a pretty good appreciation of the country as best you can, but be realistic and know where your limits are and uh, don't try to go beyond those limits, which becomes uh, hubris at that point. You know, it's interesting, I, uh, as a commander on my second tour of duty in Afghanistan, we were talking about the need for us to get out there and understand more of Afghan society. We've got to understand those village politics. We have to understand things better, work harder at this. Because, General, what we have to do is win the Afghan hearts and minds. And my response to that is no. We don't have to win the Afghan hearts and minds. The government of Afghanistan needs to win their own people's hearts and minds. They have to fight for their country. And so how much do you invest in direct action and learning uh, incredible language skills and doing this for direct intervention? How much? is enough, how much do you work instead at trying to build the Afghan government and security capabilities to deal directly with the problem with enablement from us. Um, if I could, then, to make uh, three uh, final points, uh, now speaking to uh, great Australian uh, friends here everywhere. The first is that the cost of the war in Afghanistan for all of us, for all of us, has been high. It's been high in terms of resource cost. It's been high in terms of lives lost. I know from experience in Afghanistan, twice as a commander and as the ambassador, that the Australian people should feel nothing but pride for their soldiers, for their diplomats, and for their development specialists working in a remote place like Oregon province doing absolutely extraordinary things. The second point is that I do believe that the diggers, the diplomats, and the development specialists from Australia that are serving in places like Oregon province right now, that they are going to add much more to the strength and vibrancy of your country in the years ahead. The First and the Second World War for both of us, for the Australians and the Americans, they produced veterans who became generational leaders in both of our countries. And I believe that the conflict in Afghanistan will produce some of the same for those that are serving right now in that far off land. And third and last, and I speak entirely from the heart, that I'll tell you as a former American soldier and a diplomat, 
who's been shoulder to shoulder with a lot of allied counterparts around the world in difficult spots, to include Australia, that as an American, I can think of no other person that I'd want on my right flank or on my left flank or preferably on both flanks when going gets tough than Australians. Thank you very much.